Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to participate in such an elegant course. And uh, my name is uh, Dr. Saw Haikel. I'm an adult cardiology specialist at Aswan Heart Center, McDowell Foundation. Uh, and today I'm gonna discuss with you the diastolic dysfunction assessment. Uh, it's a simple uh, topic, yet it's uh, very challenging with um, a lot of details. Uh, the points of learning from this lecture is to understand the LV diastolic normal physiology and to understand the correlation of hemodynamic changes during diastole with the echocardiographic parameters, step-by-step -step acquisition for each parameter, and to have a systematic approach for LV diastolic dysfunction assessment, and the technical challenges and pitfalls that we are facing in everyday practice. First, uh, we have to understand the LV diastolic uh, physiology. The diastole is uh, the period of cardiac cycle that begins with the closure of the aortic valve and ends with the mitral valve closure, uh, during which the ventricle uh, is continued to be filled with blood from uh, the atrium. Uh, it's composed of four sequential uh, phases uh, occurs after each other, the isovolumetric relaxation phase uh, before the mitral valve opens, uh, immediately after uh, ventricular contraction uh, ends, and the rapid filling phase, which is here, this panel or this figure represents the left ventricular pressure throughout the uh, diastole, and this figure represents the atrial cycles uh, also during the diastole as it behaves passively due to LV changes and actively due to atrial contraction at the late diastole. And if we put them together, we're gonna understand uh, the mechanisms of four of these four uh, uh, phases. First, the rapid filling phase is after the ventricle uh, contracts, the ventricular pressure drops uh, to be less than the atrial pressure here, creating a transmitral pressure gradient pro, uh, between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And here comes the rapid filling phase in the early diastole. Uh, it's a passive process. Then um, the ventricle continues to be filled uh, till it reaches a point where its pressure is nearly the same as the atrium. And then the atrium, uh, while it continues to be filled from the pulmonary veins, the pressure is increased more than the LV and creating another transmitter pressure gradient that causes uh, the atrial contraction uh, and the late filling in the late diastole. So these are the four uh, phases, the so isovolumetric relaxation phase, the rapid filling phase, and slow filling phase, or what's called diastasis, and the late filling phase caused by the atrial contraction. Um, of note that uh, none of the components is completely independent of each other, and the changes in one can influence the others in predictable or unpredictable ways. Um, we have to know this uh, very important. Uh, essentially, uh, there are uh, two characteristics of the ventricular function that contribute to the diastolic uh, function, which is the relaxation, which is an active process influencing the isovolumetric relaxation phase as a part of the early filling phase here. And sorry, and the compliance, which is a passive process influencing, uh, influencing all the three filling phases and refers to change of volume over the change of pressure. In a simple words, if we say that we have an uncompliant ventricle here, an uncompliant ventricle, it means that any change in the volume will be uh, affecting uh, the, the filling pressures. While if we have an impaired relaxing ventricle, there is no increase in the filling pressure, only there is in, in, uh, impairment in the ventricular relaxation. So let's go practical, go, uh, echocardiographic assessment of LV diastolic function. The first step in assessment of LV diastolic function is to assess the systolic function and to have a good 2D image for the ventricle to know the pathology and to know if the ventricle is normal or not. And the second step is to have the six major uh, or the six famous parameters to assess the diastolic function, which is 
transmitral Doppler flow, tissue Doppler, trans cuspid regurgitation flow velocity, lift atrial volume index, pulmonary venous flow, color MO propagation velocity. And we're gonna discuss each one of them in details. Let's start with the transmitral Doppler inflow, uh, how to get it. First, you can get the apical port chamber view and uh, put uh, the cursor aligned at the tips of the mitral valve. It's better to use the color Doppler so that it gives you an idea how the flow uh, is going, uh, or how the flow uh, direction uh, is. So you can put the cursor along the flow uh, of the, the direction of the flow. Uh, then you will get, uh, after putting the sample volume at the tips of the valve, uh, you will get these uh, waves, okay? Ask the, your patient to take a, uh, an end expiration so uh, you can get a more clear image. Optimize the scale at uh, 120 centimeters per second so that you can get uh, the end of the velocities of your waves. Uh, low your baseline. You don't want to put it so high so you cannot get the uh, all waves and not so low. Pass sweep and use low filter settings so you can get the black and white uh, differences very clear. Here, uh, here is the six variables that you can get from the transmitter Doppler. Each of one, uh, each of them is reflecting uh, one change or some changes in the diastolic dysfunction. Uh, assessment, um, first the isobarometric relaxation uh, time, then the E wave, the A wave, the deceleration time, and the A wave duration. In details, we're gonna discuss them. The mitral inflow E and A wave, it represents the pressure gradient between the LA and LV during the diastole. Uh, e wave corresponds with the early diastolic filling and now we are familiar with this uh, pressure curves uh, between the LV and LA. E wave occurs here at the early filling uh, at, as it represents the transmitter pressure gradient at early diastole. Um, early diastolic filling occurs um, nearly uh, responsible for 80% of the LV filling guided by it's only in the normal population, young age and so. Uh, and it's affected by the rate of LV relaxation and LA pressure. And A wave representing the late diastolic filling, and it accounts for 20% of the LV filling. Usually it's uh, smaller than the A wave, and uh, it, it's corresponding with the LV compliance and caused by the left atrial uh, contraction. Uh, also, we calculate the EA ratio which is the early diastolic filling compared to the late diastolic filling. And normally it should be between 0.8 to 1.5. The isovolumetric relaxation time, it represents the duration of relaxation between um, the aortic valve closure and the mitral valve opening. How to get it? We can get the apical five chamber view by opening the LVOT, getting a large sample volume to, put, to be put between the inflow and outflow, and then it will record the mitral inflow represented in E and A wave, and the aortic uh, flow represented here. Then this is the isovolumetric relaxation time. It occurs between the aortic valve closure and the aortic valve opening. Um, isovolumetric relaxation time uh, is, um, inversely proportionate to elevation of the filling pressures, and it's prolonged only in impaired relaxation. As mitral valve takes longer time to open, but uh, in normal filling pressure. While the filling pressures started to increase, while the LV diastolic dysfunction uh, continued to deteriorate, the isovolumetric relaxation time is shortened and uh, the mitral valve opens rapidly, and uh, this is due to increased LV filling pressure. Uh, E-wave deceleration time uh, represents the rate of the early filling uh, phase. Also, it has an inverse relationship with the filling pressures as the stiffer the ventricle, the shorter the, the, the deceleration time. Um, here is uh, the diagrammatic illustration. 
and the transmitral Doppler flow throughout the different grades of diastolic dysfunction. And this is the normal. And when impaired relaxation occur, the deceleration time starts to increase. Then when filling pressures is superimposed over the impaired relaxation, it starts to decrease again. Then again, it decreases. The normal uh, 160 and 20, uh, 220 and abnormal is less than 160. Uh, this video is um, il illustrative for the change in the pressure uh, curve between the LA and LV during the diastole. I think now we are very familiar with it. And uh, this is a normal transmitral Doppler. Uh, the isovolumetric relaxation time, early filling represented in the E wave, which is the, uh, responsible for the majority of the filling in the uh, early diastole, then the atrial kick, which is responsible for the minority of uh, filling at the late diastole. Okay, while um, the diastolic dysfunction starts to uh, develop, here the impaired relaxation or abnormal relaxation occurs. Now we can notice this slope. See the difference between here and here. The transmitter pressure gradient is now lesser than here. So the E wave is smaller and the isovolumetric relaxation time is prolonged and A wave is the predominant and it's responsible for the majority of filling in this phase. After that, when the pressures started to increase, sorry for this technical error. Um, when it started to increase, we can see the increase in the E wave again and uh, decrease in the A wave. This is gives the restrictive filling uh, pattern and the isovolumetric relaxation time is shortened and the deceleration time is shortened. So to wrap it up, we can uh, see this figure with the progression of LV diastolic dysfunction from being normal to impaired relaxation to pseudo-normal phase where the pressure is started to increase and to restrictive where the pressure start, uh, is also uh, markedly increased and how it reflected on the transmitral Doppler uh, different measures like EA, now it's reversed, isovolumetric relaxation time increased, deceleration time increased, then it becomes shortened again, and the EA wave have uh, the pseudo-normal pattern. If we look here at the pseudo-normal and the normal, the transmitral flow, we can tell that there is no major difference between them. And it's challenging to know it uh, only by transmitter Doppler. There is another measure to uh, further assess whether it's pseudo normal or normal. Then the restrictive filling, where there is increase in the LV filling pressures, uh, when happened, there is um, a large EA ratio and smaller isovolumetric relaxation and deceleration time. So collectively, it has a U shaped relationship with. The, the transmitter Doppler and the different grades of the diastolic dysfunction. It increase, decrease, then increase again. Here are some technical tips in uh, acquiring this uh, transmitter Dopplers and how to get it uh, correctly. Um, mitral inflow velocity, if we have uh, this arrow representing uh, a different levels of putting a sample volume from A to F. Uh, and this is a different Doppler profiles that you can get at the different levels. Then if we noticed that D is the proper uh, placement uh, side of the sample volume, and this is the Doppler uh, waves that uh, correctly we can get. And if you look at the A profile, it gives uh, the reverse E ratio uh, if we put it into the left atrial uh, cavity or F, it gives you uh, this wave. So this is the correct wave we need to have. 
Um, in everyday practice, we can face something like that, but we don't know the translation of it. It's a triphasic motor inflow. We can see a small wave after the E wave and before the A wave. What is this and what its significance? It's the L wave. Okay, what is uh, its significance and how it occurs? It's, uh, it occurs with mar markedly delayed LV relaxation in the setting of elevated LV filling pressure like in the pseudo-normal phase, as we said before, uh, when there is impaired relaxation superimposed uh, with a moderate elevation of LV filling pressure. Uh, and the, the, the translation or the explanation of this wave that uh, in elevating uh, pressure allows for ongoing LV filling in the diastasis or the slow filling phase, and thus gives this L wave forward flow. Uh, it's really see, rarely seen in normal LV diastolic function when the subject only had bradycardia, but uh, now its uh, velocity will be less than 20 centimeter per second. Uh, may be seen with AF, and it's an indicator for increased LV filling pressure in known cardiovascular disease, but it's not sensitive thing to be relied on. Um, in order to uh, know uh, the difference between the, the normal and pseudonormal filling pattern, uh, we can do Valsalva. Uh, changes of mitral inflow with Valsalva is very important. Uh, what is the Valsalva and how to make it? We can uh, make a forced expiration uh, or ask the patient to make a forced expiration. Again, is to close the glottis for 10 seconds, maintaining the thoracic pressure at 40 millimeter HG. I know it's so hard to adjust these uh, measurements, but we can try to uh, count 10 seconds uh, and make the patient uh, do the maximum, exp uh, uh, maximum straining that he can do. Um, the mechanism of Valsalva, it's, it, uh, it reduces the LV uh, preload. So the impaired relaxation pattern now is unmasked when moderate increase in the LV filling pressure is superimposed on the impaired relaxation, like in the pseudonormal phase, uh, as we said before. And it's used to differentiate between normal and pseudonormal phase, as we get an, uh, at the nearly the same transmitral doppers. A normal subject, he, uh, if we ask it a normal subject to have a basalva, and he did it correctly, the EA waves this, uh, decrease similarly with fixed EA ratio, as we can see in this figure. This is a normal transmitter Doppler and asking the patient to do Valsalva and the EA ratio is still the same. But in the pseudonormal phase, we have uh, the same transmitter Doppler flow at the start and we ask the patient to take uh, a Valsalva, then the EA ratio is increased by 50% like this example, EA ratio. This uh, We can call this a normal uh, filling pattern but after taking a Valsalva or doing a good Valsalva, uh, the ear ratio become reversed and decrease by 50%. And this is characteristic for the pseudonormal phase. In restrictive filling pattern, if we ask the patient to do Valsalva and it's in the late late stages, nothing will happen. This, it, will be, it will have the same uh, measures. Okay, effect of heart rate on uh, transmitral Doppler velocities. Uh, it's uh, uh, very, very, very important to know that the transmitral Doppler is affected uh, dramatically by heart rate. And if we look to these two pictures on the left, uh, they are of the same patient, by the way. On the left, this is uh, the transmitral Doppler of a patient at a heart rate of 82 and gives the uh, EA ratio uh, uh, and the impaired relaxation pattern. And after reducing the heart rate, this is the transmitral Doppler, which is uh, pseudonormal or normal. And uh, this is because something called fusion. Uh, how to, do, how to uh, assess this, uh, how to uh, configure this fusion, uh, consider the mitral velocity at the onset of E wave. This is uh, this arrow is pointing at it here. And if it's more than twenty centimeter per second, then the E ratio is reduced only due to fusion. 
not due to uh, a true uh, the, the reduction in the EU wave. Here, it's falsely impaired relaxation, but here it's a pseudo normal or normal pattern, which is no, which is the correct thing after reduction of the heart rate. It seems like a very crowded slide, but we need to know only two informations from this. Uh, the effect of age on the transmitral Doppler and tissue Doppler imaging, by the way, till we reach the slides of the tissue Doppler. This is the velocity uh, and this is the age progression. There are many studies that discussed the, uh, uh, the population study on the European, uh, European wide, the NOR study is very famous study that was done on the 449 people, uh, discussing the changes of the transmitter Doppler and tissue Doppler with age. With age progression, we can see that the E wave is re reduced and the EE ratio is reduced. And uh, the A wave is uh, increased or maybe increased a little bit. And the, uh, when we look at the tissue Doppler, the E wave reduced with progression of age. Also the A wave uh, increased and the e, a, uh, e, e prime is increased. Let's not talk about the tissue Doppler now. Just focus on the EA and EA ratio changes with uh, 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 the progression of age. And we will get to the tissue Doppler in the next couple of slides. So learning tips from the transmitter Doppler. Uh, in patients with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction, transmitter Doppler inflow is usually sufficient to identify patients with increased left atrial pressure. Uh, and deceleration time at this uh, state is an important predictor for outcome in patients with reduced uh, ejection fraction uh, when it is uh, less than 160 milliseconds. And in patients with known coronary artery disease or HOCAM or ejection fraction more than 50%, mitral inflow is poorly correlated with LV filling pressure, and we cannot rely on it. This is two uh, very two important things to know. Also, the transmitral Doppler uh, is age dependent and E wave is decreased with age. It's a preload dependent. That's why Valsalva changes the whole idea. Heart rate dependent, as we uh, recently uh, mentioned. Uh, more challenging to be applied with arrhythmias. And in the presence of AF, A wave will not be there and you will not be able to uh, calculate the AA ratio and the, the, the other measures. In the pseudo-normal phase, there is impaired relaxation or superimposed with increased LV filling pressure. And if you uh, decrease the preload, you can figure out uh, underlying impaired relaxation. And Valsalva is taken, it is difficult and technically challenging as it could be standardized in all patients. And it's difficult to maintain the sample volume at the tips of the mitral valve during straining. So uh, we cannot apply Valsalva for all the patients. Now we have to know, and um, we have to get another parameter to differentiate between the pseudo-normal and normal phase. Um, maybe this is, here comes the rule of the tissue Doppler of the mitral annulus. It measures the, the tissue velocity rather than the blood velocity. At the systole, uh, the mitral annulus uh, goes down toward the apex, and the, during the diastole, the mitral annulus goes down uh, uh, be, um, out, um, away from the apex, uh, giving these two uh, negative waves. There are four uh, things to measure, to be measured from the tissue Doppler, the S wave reflecting the upward displacement of the mitral annulus during systole, E wave dash representing the early filling phase, which coincides with the mitral E wave, and the A wave were representing the early uh, sorry, the late failing phase, and it coincides with the uh, mitral A wave and the E, transmitral E Doppler uh, related to the uh, E dash uh, ratio. Uh, acquisition. First, you have to get your epical four chamber view. Uh, press the tissue Doppler, sorry, press the tissue Doppler button. Um, at your machine, then you get these colors, put the cursor at the lateral annulus and at the medial annulus parallel uh, to the annular motion. 
try to narrow your sector so that you can get a better uh, frame of the image. Then you will get these two uh, Doppler waves. Notably here, the media have a lower velocities than the lateral freely mobile. Uh, lateral wall always give higher velocities and the median give lower. Uh, E-wave reflects tissue velocity during relaxation. E dash, not E-wave. E-wave is reflecting the transmitter dope. E dash wave reflects tissue velocity during relaxation. Normally, E dash velocity at the medial annulus is more than seven and uh, uh, is more than 10 normally at the lateral annulus. Um, but as we said before, if we have a pseudo-normal pattern with EA ratio nearly the same as the normal filling, we can define uh, the difference by doing Valsalva, and we said it's technically challenging. So we have to know uh, another measure that differentiate between them. Um, knowing that the transmitral Doppler have a U-shaped relationship with deterioration of or progression of the diastolic function, uh, it's very, very important to know that E dash is decreased in all degrees in, of the diastolic uh, dysfunction, as we say here. There is no change in this pseudo-normal phase like what happened at the transmitral Doppler. Frankly speaking, normal E dash equals normal diastolic function, as it is, again, decreased in all degrees of diastolic dysfunction. Uh, it's less load dependent than conventional blood transmitral Doppler parameters, uh, which is one of its advantages. And LV filling pressure have a minimal effect on E dash wave in the presence of impaired relaxation. This is why in the pseudonormal phase, we don't get this profile as we get in the transmitral Doppler flow. EE prime or EE dash, we can uh, divide the E, uh, the transmitral E wave by getting first the E wave, then we put at the lateral annulus and at the septal annulus, uh, it predicts the LV filling pressure. EE dash is uh, used to predict the LV filling pressure and the correct the effect of LV relaxation on mitral E. Uh, AC guidelines recommended using an average value of septal and lateral E, although if you want to use one of them, it's uh, completely accepted. Uh, EE dash ratio less than eight is usually indicate normal LV filling pressure. If we divide E on E dash and having eight, it's normal. If we divide E and over E dash and it's more than 14, it's highly specific for elevated LV filling pressure. But what about the value between eight and 14? It's a gray zone that need other measures also to uh, confirm increasing the LV filling pressures. Uh, of note, if we used, uh, not using average, if we use the septal, the E dash is uh, normally less than 15. And if we use the lateral E dash, so the E, e dash uh, normally is, will be less than 13. Here is some technical tips about the sample volume placement site and machine setting. On the left upper panel, this is the normal uh, uh, trans. Uh, this is the normal uh, tissue Doppler image with the normal waves E, A, and S. This uh, coincides with isobarometric contraction time, by the way, before S. And uh, this, when we put the sample volume at the interventricular septum, we, we will get a very different shape of the waves. And this, when we have a very low gain. We cannot define uh, the waves correctly. And then when we use a high filter, this is more noise than we can ever imagine. Also, this slide is to highlight the importance of beam alignment. As we said, we should put the cursor at uh, the annulus parallel to the motion or uh, direction of the annulus. So this is the motion direction of the motion of the annulus directed upward. And this is the beam incorrectly or suboptimal uh, aligned. 
And here is uh, the optimal tissue Doppler beam alignment parallel to the direction of the annulus uh, movement. Here we can see you can get uh, velocities very poor and very uh, decreased. And here is the normal. Just the beam alignment can give you a completely different picture. Limitation of tissue Doppler imaging. Uh, it's an angle dependent, as we said. Uh, e dash is an age dependent as it decreases with age. Remember the slide that was so crowded and we said that we will skip it, uh, the tissue Doppler imaging the NOR study. This uh, now is mentioned that the E wave is age dependent and it decreases with age like the transmitter E. And EE dash has a gray zone in which the LV filling pressure is indeterminate and the EE prime uh, or EE dash ratio is not accurate in heavily calcified annulus at the mitral valve disease, pericardial disease, regional wall motion abnormality at the sample size and the at the sample segment, sorry, and hokum and lift bonded branch block and the pulmonary hypertension. This is a major limitations for using the EE prime. Here we come to the third uh, method to assess the diastolic function, the pulmonary venous flow. First, you get the apical four chamber view. Uh, try to visualize the, the right upper pulmonary vein or left upper pulmonary vein and uh, put a large sample volume, they placed one or two centimeter into the pulmonary vein. Try to use the color Doppler, it will help you to get the direction uh, of the flow. Then you will get this Doppler U. First wave is S wave, and it uh, consists of a positive wave, or it consists of two waves, uh, actually, this and this. Uh, all we need to know, it uh, represents the systolic filling of the atrium, where the atrium acts as a reservoir of blood from the uh, pulmonary vein. And the, the D wave, which represents also forward flow from the pulmonary vein to the atrium during the early diastolic filling, at, and it coincides with the uh, E wave, the transmitter E wave. And the atrial vessel wave, which represented here, and it is coincides with the mitral A wave or atrial contraction. Also, we can calculate the SD ratio. Normally, the S ratio, the SD ratio is more than one as the atrium uh, fills in the systole or the flow in the pulmonary veins is more in the systole than the diastole. And we have a small A wave uh, during atrial contraction normally okay then when uh, the pressure started uh, the filling pressure started to increase and the, the lv filling uh, pressures uh, with increase the lv diastolic uh, dysfunction grade uh, the systolic wave become more blunted and the d wave is uh, more prominent like here s wave is blunted and d wave is more prominent as the filling occur at this state, at the early filling, more than the systole. And the A wave become more prominent during atrial contraction. When the restrictive filling or markedly increase in the LA and LV filling pressure occur, the systolic wave become reversed. And the blood is pumped during uh, this uh, phase, during the ventricular systole, uh, towards the pulmonary vein like here, okay? And the A wave also, it become more prominent and more having more duration. Okay, um, the fifth thing to be measured from the pulmonary vein flow is the atrial reversal duration minus the mitral A wave duration as simply to know uh, how it reflects the assessment. When the atrium contracts, it pump blood through the, sorry, through the mitral valve and through the pulmonary valve. When the LA pressure uh, become markedly increased, it pump the blood in the both directions and pump more into the pulmonary vein with uh, more duration of, uh, of blood pumping into the pulmonary vein gives the pulmonary vein duration more than the mitral A wave duration by 30 milliseconds. And this correlates well with increased LV diastolic, uh, elevated LV and diastolic pressure. Learning tips also, 
the relationship between the pulmonary vein systolic filling fraction and the LA pressure has limited accuracy in normal ejection fraction and in AF, mitral valve disease and hookum. So what to do? The atrial reversal minus A wave duration is the best and most sensitive earliest indicator for increased LA pressure. And uh, uh, fortunately, it's independent of age and ejection, uh, LV ejection fraction. It's accurate in patient with mitral regurg and patient with hookum, but not applicable in AF or sinus tachycardia. Uh, fourth thing to be, to, to be measured to assess the LV in diastolic uh, or LV diastolic dysfunction is the left atrial volume. Lift atrial uh, volume reflects the cumulative effect of increased LV filling pressure over time. How to get it? We have to get the apical four chamber view and the apical two chamber view. And uh, we measure at the end of systole before mitral valve open at the end of T wave. Here we can get the maximum uh, volume of the atrium. Tracing the endocardial border of the atrium, excluding the left uh, atrial appendage and the pulmonary veins and the subannular plane. Then in the two uh, planes, epic four and epical two, here we get the area one and area two, and measure the maximum lens parallel to the axis of left atrium in these two uh, way, uh, uh, views. Then the machine will calculate the maximum left atrial volume. So we don't need to know this. Uh, uh, formula and will be indexed to the body surface area as index maximum left atrial volume if more than 34 milli per meter uh, square it is considered abnormal. Let's go in some way practical. I know it's very boring to just say something uh, without an uh, application. So now we have a 45 year old male uh, with EE-8 uh, which is normal an AA wave uh, 1.1, uh, no tricuspid regurgitation, well, which is normal, but the left atrial volume index is uh, more than uh, 35 milli per meter square. Do you consider this a uh, patient with a diastolic dysfunction? We all have the impression that whenever we see uh, the left atrial uh, dilated or uh, volume increase, there is underlying diastolic dysfunction without searching for other causes. Definitely no, it's a completely normal uh, diastolic function for this uh, gentleman. And we have to know the other causes of LE dilatation rather than the diastolic function. First, the bradycardia, high output states, uh, atrial flutter or fibrillation, significant mitral valve disease, the mitral stenosis or GERG, also, the well-trained athletes who have bradycardia and well hydrated, we can tell that we can um, usually see the left atrial volume increased. And the last thing, the measurement errors, which is the I think it's the most common thing uh, in the area, left atrial assessment errors, including left atrial uh, foreshortening. Here is an example. This is the apical four chamber view proper where is we can see the left A ventricle uh, and the apex is completely seen and good. Then uh, the left atrium here is off axis. See the beam is cutting the left ventricle very good, then cutting the left atrium in a very short segment and giving it a falsely uh, small size. But in order to get the correct uh, volume of the left atrium, we have to get the left ventricle foreshortened. And the, the, the view should be dedicated to see the whole left atrial wall. Uh, even if we uh, can see the ventricle very well, we don't need to assess the ventricle right now. We, don't, we want to see the atrium and we want the beam to cut the left ventricle foreshortened, the butt cut the left atrium at the center to get the good uh, idea and good uh, alignment so that we can see the left atrial maximum volume. Uh, fifth method to reflect the diastolic dysfunction is the tricuspid regurgitation jet velocity. 
there is a significant correlation exists between the systolic pulmonary artery pressure and non-invasively drive left atrial pressure, but importantly, in the absence of pulmonary disease. If the tricuspid regurgitate velocity is more than 2.8, is it's considered abnormal. Uh, the sex method, the color M mood propagation velocity, which represents the rate of LV relaxation, especially in reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, how to get it and what it, its significance? Um, its significance, it measures the flow propagation during early diastole from the mitral annulus towards the apex. Uh, how to get it? The technique is to um, get the apical four chamber view, put the color Doppler at the LV cavity till the apex, shift the color baseline toward the mitral inflow. As we said here, this is 70, nearly 70, and here is uh, 53, where the highest velocity jet is at the center and uh, labeled with uh, nearly blue, and put the ammo mode aligned at the direction of the flow from the mitral to the apex. While uh, the diastolic function deteriorates, the slope flattens. This is normal slope, and this is normal transmitral. And when impaired relaxation, the slope become more steep. And with impaired or uh, restricted filling and increased filling pressure, the slope become more and more steep. Uh, propagation velocity is uh, normally more than 50 centimeter per second, but if we if it's decreased it to be less than 45 centimeter per second, it reflects abnormal relaxation. As we said again, it's not uh, accurate uh, in normal LV uh, filling, uh, normal LV ejection fraction. It's more accurate in the pressed ejection fraction. And if we get the E wave, the transmitral E wave through the mitral valve uh, in relation to the propagation velocity, which represents uh, the blood flow from the annulus to the apex, if we get this ratio more than 2.5, then it's correlated with elevated lift atrial pressure and pulmonary capillary pressure pressure more than 15. Uh, this is to wrap all the things up together uh, and to know that LV relaxation uh, during the different grades of diastolic dysfunction is uh, in grade one impaired, in grade two impaired, and grade three it's impaired throughout the cycles, throughout uh, the different degrees of diastolic dysfunction. And the left atrial pressure uh, begins to increase uh, during the grade two and grade three, mitral EA ratio is uh, normal from 0.8 to point, uh, is normal uh, more than 0.8, but it's abnormal if uh, it's more than two, it uh, reflects an impaired re uh, relaxation with uh, rapid uh, with increased LV filling pressures and restrictive filling pattern. The EA ratio average, uh, if more than 14, means increased filling pressure and it's less than 10, it's normal. And retrocuspid regurgitation velocity also, uh, as we said, the LA volume index is increased, uh, it started to increase from the grade two. Okay, uh, now let's go in some way practical. Uh, we are about to finish, so we need to uh, know what to uh, what to do and how to deal with a patient uh, with a diastolic dysfunction and how to assess it. Practical approach to diastolic dysfunction. Uh, my reference is the ACE CAVI guidelines and standards uh, that it was released in 2016. Um, with that uh, said, that we have four major diagnostic parameters in assessing the LV diastolic dysfunction in any patient. First one is the E wave uh, velocity. E dash wave velocity, let's say it E prime, so it's more simple. The E prime velocity, uh, if more than seven, it's uh, uh, at medial uh, annulus, it's normal. If more than 10 at the lateral annulus, it's normal. Uh, the E E dash, uh, the E E prime less than 14 average or less than 15 medial. Tricuspid regurgitation velocity less than or equal 2.8. Lift HL volume index is 
less than 34 milli per meter square. So four parameters started with the tissue Doppler, E dash, uh, EE prime, TR velocity, and the LA volume. Notice here that not uh, the first measure is the transformator Doppler, EE, the uh, EE ratio, and the EE uh, velocity. He didn't mention this at the first step. The four major parameters, we have to know it uh, very uh, uh, importantly. There are two flow charts for patients with LV normal function and LV abnormal function. Uh, to assess the, their LV in the uh, diastolic dysfunction. First flow chart uh, with the ventricle, normal LV ventricle. First, we have to assess the four major parameters we said uh, uh, immediately, the average EE ratio, the septal uh, E prime velocity, and the lateral E prime velocity, TR velocity, and lift edge volume index. And we, if we have uh, more than two positive, yeah, uh, I mean, if we have an average EE dash more than 14 or uh, plus any of these, more than 50% positive of any of these four variables, it means that we have a diastolic dysfunction. But if we have less than 50% or less than two of these variables uh, positive, there is a normal diastolic function. But if two is positive, two are positive and two are negative, there is an intermediate phase that needs more assessment by different uh, methods like the pulmonary vein and uh, propagation velocity and other things that we mentioned before. So first, depend on these four major characters, EE dash, septal E velocity, lateral E velocity, TR velocity, and lift edge volume index. And this is a flow chart with patients with reduced ejection fraction. Here, we can uh, appreciate that they started the assessment with the transmitral inflow Doppler, the E and A, uh, rather than starting with the tissue Doppler in the previous uh, chart. And it's simplified that in patient with reduced ejection fraction, if we found the EA ratio more than two, then no need to measure anything else and the lift eater pressure now is increased and we consider this a grade three diastolic dysfunction. And inpatient with reduced ejection fraction and mod transmitral Doppler is less than eight, with E velocity less than 50, then we have a normal lift eater pressure. We have a grade one diastolic dysfunction. But if we have this intermediate value between 0.8 and 2, EA ratio between 0.8 and 2, we have to evaluate the other three characters or the other three variables we said before. The EE dash, if average more than 14, or tricuspid regurgitation velocity more than 2.8, or the lift HL volume index more than three, uh, 34 millimeter, uh, milli per meter uh, uh, square. If we have two of these three variables positive, two of three, or three of three positive, we have an elevated LV filling pressure and a grade two diastolic function. And if we have two of three, or all these variables is negative, we have a normal uh, LA pressure and a grade one diastolic function. If we don't have these three variables and we have only two, if the two are negatives, so the norm, there is a normal LA pressure and grade one diastolic function. If the two are positive, there is an elevated LA uh, pressure and grade two diastolic function. I know this is a bit tough and a bit, a bit uh, uh, not practical. So let's have some examples on the real cases. This is a 66 year old female with a normal ejection fraction, as we can appreciate. And uh, EE dash is 15. If we checked about the previous algorithm, it's increased. E septal is six, and it's also decreased. 
Tricuspid regurgitation velocity is 2.6. No, it didn't reach the 2.8 that uh, is uh, said in the algorithm. And the LA volume index is 35 milli per meter square. If we checked about this uh, lady, uh, how to assess uh, her diastolic function? If we can say uh, it's a normal or a impaired relaxation or diastolic function grade two. Of course, it's a diastolic function grade two, although it's a tricuspid regurgitation is not uh, fulfilling that criteria, but we have this one and this one and this one, three out of four is positive. So this is a pseudonormal phase. Um, 40 year old male, ejection fraction 25%, dilated cardiomyopathy. EA uh, transmitral Doppler is 2.7. I think we don't need anything else to say that it's a restrictive filling pattern and increased LV, uh, LV filling pressure. Uh, third case or third example, 50 year old female, impaired ejection fraction, Start with the EA transmitral Doppler, and we found it 0.96. In the gray zone, or in the middle of the flow chart, we said, sorry, we said uh, before, uh, the E septal is reduced 4.6, one of the checkpoints. EE dash is 20, another one of the checkpoints there. Tricuspid regurgitation velocity is 2.5, which is not with us. And lift atrial volume is increased 37 milli per meter square. So definitely here, the LV, uh, LA pressure uh, increased. Tricuspid regurgitation is not fulfilling that criteria. E is the reduced and E ratio is the, in the gray zone 0.9. Uh, so this is a uh, grade two diastolic dysfunction and uh, uh, left atrial pressure is increased. If we don't have one of these, as we said before, if the two are positive, then we have uh, elevated LV pressure. If the two are negative, uh, we have an impaired relaxation. Sometimes we need to get uh, uh, a, a, a trans Doppler, uh, the, the pulmonary vein trans Doppler, so that it aids uh, in the diagnosis and the area in the flow chart in the middle here. If we can't get all these variables, we can get the pulmonary vein SD uh, ratio. If it's less than one, it will help in the diagnosis also. Uh, the last example, uh, the 70 years old male with normal ejection fraction. I envy him for his ejection fraction, by the way. And the E septal is uh, six. E A prime average is seven. And the index left iter volume is 30 and with no tricuspid regurgitation but the EA uh, ratio is 0.8. What do, what do you think? I think this is uh, impaired relaxation, normal age-related uh, diastolic function. I will not even call it an impaired relaxation uh, or diastolic dysfunction. Uh, one last rare thing to be mentioned in the diastolic dysfunction, what we can get here is a diastolic mitral regurg during the diastole. E, A, which represents the filling in the diastole. Now we're still in the diastole. Then this is the systole. What is this wave? This is the uh, diastolic mitral regurgitation. It's a very rare condition and it's, uh, oh, it occurred in markedly increase in LV pressure more than atrial pressure at any phase of the diastole. Uh, also, it occurs in severe acute aortic regurgitation and the complete heart block sometimes. Last two slides. Uh, very important to uh, mention that the atrial fibrillation 
and the assessment of diastolic dysfunction during atrial fibrillation is very, very challenging as you have no A wave, so you can't get the EA or the A duration or the atrial reversal to A duration. Um, to assess the diastolic dysfunction, you have to uh, fulfill these five uh, or to follow these five parameters. Uh, first, the peak acceleration rate of the mitral E velocity, which is measured here from uh, the baseline or from the base of the E wave till it reaches its apex. And uh, if it's more than 1,900 centimeters per second, it means that there is increase in LV pinning pressure. Also, the isovolumetric relaxation time, if it's less than 65 meters per second, uh, and the deceleration time of the E wave, if it's less than 160 uh, meters per second, and it's very specific in heart failure reduced ejection fraction. And if we uh, measure the E, transmitral E, to the propagation velocity, and it was more than 1.4. Uh, also, the septal EE prime ratio, if it's more than 11. This is a different cutoff points uh, regarding to the atrial fibrillation. And importantly, importantly, we have to know that the measurements are averaged over five beats. Every measure you have should be averaged over uh, uh, five beats. Um, also, uh, the market variability in E-wave velocity score is, uh, correlates with the filling pressure not increased. Um, I mean, if you have these consistent velocities throughout uh, a different uh, beats, this means that the LV pressure is high. But if we have a market variability, one is high, one is low, one is high, and one, different between beat to beat, it means that the LV reflects that the LV filling pressure is not so much high. Last slide, constructive pericarditis. The patients usually have uh, a septal bounce by 2D uh, as the filling pressure is increased uh, on the left ventricle and the left uh, and the right ventricle uh, together. So uh, we have a respiratory variations on the transmitral and the transtracuspid. Uh, with inspiration, it increases on the trans uh, or tricuspid mitral Doppler more than 40% between the inspiration and expiration and uh, the mitral by 25%. And uh, using tissue Doppler, the, we have a very characteristic thing that's called endless reverses, as patients usually have a septal E velocity higher than the lateral E velocity, which is not, uh, uh, we are not getting used to this. And EE dash in this uh, state uh, shouldn't be used to estimate the LV filling pressure. Uh, also, uh, the septal bounce is very characteristic for the diagnosis. So the take home message is assessment of diastolic function is uh, challenging and tricky. Uh, make sure that data is concordant. Uh, no single parameter can be conclusive in the diagnosis of diastolic dysfunction. Uh, organized approach is a must. Avoid the technical errors we mentioned before. Uh, first step in use is to evaluate the LV systolic function before evaluating the LV diastolic function. Uh, Transmitral Doppler is markedly dependent on age, heart rate, and loading conditions. Tissue Doppler imaging is less load dependent. LV myocardial relaxation represented in the E dash is impaired in all degrees of the diastolic dysfunction. If we get a normal E dash, you get a normal diastolic function. Uh, Transmitral Doppler is not accurate in normal ejection fraction, and other measures should be integrated. So it's a major, major, major fault when you have a normal patient and you put a transmitral Doppler and you're just assess the diastolic function uh, from it. It's not completely accurate. But if you have a patient with a transmitral uh, Doppler uh, only and reduced ejection fraction, it may be sufficient for the diagnosis if you have an EA ratio more than two, and restrictive or less than 0.8, uh, which is impaired relaxation, reflected to impaired relaxation. 
E-wave deceleration time, if it's more uh, less than 160 in heart failure due to ejection fraction, it have a high uh, specific, uh, specificity and uh, for detection of the poor outcome. And it coincides with a very high filling pressures. In AF patient, measured an average over five beats and beat to beat variability is decreased with elevated filling pressure. And in constructive pericarditis, there is an analysis reverses. And thank you.